Today's episode of the Stallside Podcast was brought to you by Rudin Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy. But how are you doing? I'm well, Peter. You do good today? I'm better than good. I'm great. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I know that's probably not true. But um, yeah, this week on Stallside, we've got two of our um, uh, theragenology experts on. Yeah, a couple show. that we've had on the show before, but we're going to put them together and um, talk about some of the, you, you know, um, New changes that we've got happening here at Root and Riddle. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Charlie Scoggin and Dr. Mariah Schnobrick are going to talk about um, advanced reproductive technologies, about uh, in vitro fertilization, and also intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or ICSI. That's right. And it's... Uh a very advanced procedure, and these guys have got it nailed. Yeah, it's actually pretty impressive. I mean, they've gone a long way in a short time, and uh, there's foals on the ground, so we're very impressed. Yep, yep, they're doing some things in reproduction that, uh, you know, we're, we're allows some horses to reproduce that couldn't otherwise and keeps horses in, um, you know, showing when they couldn't otherwise, so doing some good things. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's good technology. So this week on Stallside, we're talking to Dr. Charlie Scoggin and Dr. Mariah Schnobrick from the Rudin Riddle Theragenology Service about advanced reproductive technologies. <laughs> Dr. Scoggin, Dr. Snowbrick, welcome to Stallside. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Great to have you here. So, Charlie, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, well, from uh, Colorado originally, but I uh, now consider myself mostly a Kentuckian, and my family's um, rooted here. And uh, yeah, I've been here at Root and Riddle now for eight years, um, but that's the longest tenure at a job I've ever had. Mm. So, let's yeah. explain something for you guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the past uh, few years, I've been focused on uh, developing our in vitro fertilization lab. And that's, that's why I'm here today to talk about that. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Mariah, tell us a bit about yourself. All right. Um, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and then came to Kentucky um, right after vet school. And, um, and then I've been here ever since I finished my residency and love Kentucky. Yeah, so I, I, we're all kind of in the same boat that we're not from Kentucky, but our kids are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, very yes, true. They are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they call the ocean a, a big creek. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness, geography is lacking. Okay, so um, Charlie, tell us about the IVF lab. Oh boy, where where to begin? Um, so we we christened our IVF lab August first, twenty twenty. So we're what a little bit past three years now since we first got it up and running. And um, I guess to put it in a nutshell, we've come a long way. Um, we are now in what we consider the commercial phase of the lab, whereby uh, we just start offering commercial services uh, to anyone who wants to pursue uh, in vitro fertilization. And, and what that means right now is um, offering intracytoplasmic sperm injection or, or ICSI, whereby we fertilize a single egg um, with a single sperm, grow it up to uh, an embryo that we can then freeze or, or transfer. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been in, uh, we're currently in a commercial phase. Prior to that, we were in our experimental uh, and then our soft rollout phase. And um, <clears throat> our commercial phase was kind of signified by the fact that uh, we've gotten what we consider commercial results. And we have quite a few foals on the ground now to uh, proving our, our metal uh, and, um, and uh, all the, the time uh, that we put into developing the lab. So, so we're in a we're in a thoroughbred area. No thoroughbred applications here, at least for not for the breed. What what was the point of build, building a lab here in Lexington, Kentucky, in the thoroughbred capital of the world? Oh uh, well, um, I guess number one was the demand from our our other or non thoroughbred clients. Uh, I want to you know. You know, shout out our our saddlebred clients. Uh, they've been um, very, very supportive of it. Um, you know, we've heard from several breeders. Uh, you guys need to start your own, and we've heard that for several years. Um, but then uh, also um, other breeds too, quarter horses, uh, and I'm sure Mariah can speak to uh, the, the the jumpers and warm bloods. Too. Yep. Yeah, the, so the increase in show jumpers and sport horses in the area, and just the the need for locations that can recover the eggs as well as create embryos out of them, which is what the lab is doing, has increased and we've seen dramatically throughout the United States and definitely in Kentucky. And there are some applications for the thoroughbreds too. We were talking about for some mares that those very rare mares that you're trying to figure out if there's fertility issues, is it at the level of the oocyte? You could do some 
assays in the ICSI lab that would be useful and even for subfertile stallions. So trying to understand maybe we can't get a live pregnancy, but if we can inseminate the eggs, are there possibilities? So use it a diagnostic tool rather than mm-hmm. in the end. Exactly. You could, and there's and there's some crossbreeds too. So some stallions will even have thoroughbred stallions, you know, will crossbreed out of the breed. And so there's some uses there if they don't have to be registered as a thoroughbred. Mm-hmm. So how do you start, right? You sort of said you went through the soft rollout. Now you feel that you're commercial, but you've got to start from somewhere. So what's the thought process you go through and how do you actually start setting up the lab so you can build on that to get to the point that we've talked about? Boy, that's a, that's a great question. And and we found there, there was no cookbook um, for it. Um, so it, that entailed a lot of um, communication um, with other labs, uh, trying to, to suss out information from them. Although I, I will say that in some instances, it was a, it was a little bit, bit tough. Everybody's kind of got their own little secret sauce and um, recognizing that we're like, we were going to be in it for commercial reasons. They viewed us as competition and, um, and that's understandable. So uh, I guess we pursued mostly academic routes initially. Uh, I went over to CSU, trained there for a little while, um, and then just kind of got a feel for what type of equipment is needed, uh, what type of materials are needed, what type of environment is needed. We'll probably touch on environment and air quality a little bit later. Um, and then what type of investment we would be looking at, because this is not something that you can just snap your fingers and start up right away. We knew it was going to be a long-term investment. So after spending time there, it was then collaborating with the rest of the group and saying, Hey, we got to, we're looking at probably three to five years before we're going to be commercial. Um, and this is what we're looking at. Can we do this? Uh, And then once the group was okay with it, then we came to, to the shareholders with the plan. And I can't tell you how many of those, uh, what are they called? P&Ls or, or whatever I sat down with, with Debbie to, to, to do and um, all that type of thing. Because, um, you know, many ways, we're, we're a business too. And we, we want to make sure we offer the best quality services. But we, we also want to make sure that um, we're able to, to afford um, the, to provide these services to our clients. So we want to make it a, um, I don't want to say a profitable biz- business, but one that a self-propagating uh, lab so we can continue to pursue cutting edge techniques. Yeah, because it is, and we, as you pointed out, Lexington's not just a thoroughbred area. It's mm-hmm. a very diverse area, and being able to provide a variety of service for our clients is, is uh, very helpful to them. Mm-hmm. And you look at Mariah's practice. I mean, she's probably the most diverse out of all of us from, from farms that she goes to, to in-clinic appointments, to fetal sexing and all that stuff, too. And um so, you know, her perspective, I think, is more global and, and she can, you know, she came up with the idea about how you could potentially use this as a diagnostic method um, in horses. So um, all that stuff is pretty, pretty interesting, really. You touched on some things in the lab, talking about the environment, talking about equipment. So what's special about the environment? Like, you sounds like you're just not going to set this up on the kitchen counter at home. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure you, you could, uh, but yeah, there, there's been several studies, you know, mostly born in, in, from human IVF labs to show that uh, air quality can not only uh, impact how your the eggs mature and, and, and culture and develop into embryos, but also into can they form pregnancies and then live birth rates too. Um, so that that's one thing. One of the bigger things I wish I knew going into that I that I know now. Um, we did not emphasize air quality. Um, we, uh, we, we tried to pick a clean area and then construct from, from that. But, um, uh, yeah, we, we, we do not, uh, we did not emphasize it initially. And as a result, we've had to kind of retrofit things. Uh, and I think if we had known that from the outset, it would have been very useful. But, um, the academic institutions I went to, they, they did not necessarily have like a positive pressure, um, ventilation system and, and, um, uh, uh, rapid air change that, and that type of thing. Um, so, uh, but yes, that can have definitely have an effect, especially with respect to particulates in the air and, and volatile organic compounds or VOCs. Uh, in our lab and even in the repro lab, VOCs has become like a, a bad word. Mm. You say, gosh, it yeah. smells bad in here. I wonder what the VOCs are. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there's been direct correlations. The higher the VOCs, the lower your embryonic development rates. And, and we've shown that even in our lab. So we try to keep the VOCs zero. 
Yeah, okay. volatile organic Good compounds. compounds. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, okay, so that's that the air quality, but um, equipment-wise, oh, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of stuff like how do you actually – go from soup to nuts right how do you actually start from some uh, nothing and actually get to something i mean what's the process what are these pitfalls along the way and what are the things you've found out that have allowed you to be successful um well e equipment uh, you know i strongly encourage people to purchase good quality equipment because you really do get what you pay for um and not just in terms of uh, the sturdiness of the equipment but but technical support customer support um uh, you know, there is a, a lot of instances where we were putting together or, or having issues just with what we'd call the micro injectors or micro manipulators. And all that meant was maybe wiggling a tube or, or loose or tightening up a screw somewhere. Um, and the fact that we um, had good relationships with our customer service helped. Um, but again, this was just walking into other labs and kind of seeing, okay, this is where they where they have, or this is the type of equipment that they have. Um, this is how they have it stationed because um, as we're finding out in our lab, it's all about workflow. How if um, not, not just going fast, cause we don't go fast cause going fast slows you down in the IVF mm -hmm. lab. But we wanna be efficient cause we don't, we wanna make sure that those eggs and sperm are only exposed to the environment for a very short period of time. Um, and uh, by doing things like monitoring air quality, using proper equipment, that keeps the eggs nice and nice and happy and the embryos. So talk about the process of actually doing the injection, right? I mean, yeah, this just take us through a real yeah. elementary yeah. viewpoint of, of what ICSI is. Okay. Um, maybe I could use some videos <laughs> sure. um, to, to uh, kind of show what that's like. Uh, let's see. So the first video I'm going to show here is uh, hopefully using the PAs. Well, there's two methods of, um, of injection, we use both uh, commercial, or excuse me, conventional ICSI, uh, which uses this um, sharp tip uh, pipette uh, to then immobilize and, and, and suck up a sperm. Uh, let me go ahead and, and play that back again for you guys. It might have skipped there, but you can see a sperm swimming across the screen. Then we bring the pipette down in a per perpendicular fashion. That uh, one's a goner. <laughs> <laughs> and give it a nice little kink in the tail. And once we uh, do that, uh, we need to then suck it up um, and, and prepare it uh, to be injected into the oocyte. So you'll see our, our pipette come into view. We, we kind of straighten it out a little bit so we can suck it up by the tail. Uh, and now we're, we're ready uh, to go um, uh, inject. And then so this is what um, a conventional injection looks like. Uh, we have a mature oocyte signified by the presence of a polar body here at 12 o'clock. Uh, the pipette is then um, used to breach both the zona pellucida uh, and the oplasmic membrane. We're then going to suck up some oplasm, um, which I'll show you here. And these are oocytes or eggs that we've pulled out of the mare's ovary. So the mare would have to come in for a procedure where you're using a transvaginal ultrasound and a needle to go into the ovary, into the follicle, pull out the egg, and then we are putting it in media and giving it to the ICSI lab. So what you're seeing is that oocyte developed after. And while you've got that picture of that oocyte up there, maybe you could explain okay. to us what's, what's different about an equine embryo or oocyte versus a... Uh, human sure yeah then no, that's a let me um pull that pull a picture because there's there's some complications with um with horses that don't exist in in humans right yep and in other domestic species yeah that's the wrong the wrong video but yeah i probably got ahead of myself i went straight to the you said the icsi procedure yeah. but i mean <laughs> it actually started about. way way <laughs> way ahead of way way before that you just thought a guy that eats dessert first <laughs> <laughs> He's been yeah. locked in the lab. <laughs> yeah, would probably way too long. Um, so I can hand if you want me to. Yeah, answer. go ahead. So while you pull up, but mm -hmm. you know, in humans and cattle, you collect sperm and and the eggs or oocyte from the female, and you can basically put them in layman's term in a petri dish and fertilization will occur the sperm will be able to get into the egg and give its dna to make an embryo and in the horse traditionally that hasn't been the case so you have to do these advanced procedures where you actually place the sperm into the egg and only in the last 
two year, year and a half, have there been procedures where maybe we might be able to have the sperm penetrating and achieving fertilization in a dish, but ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection that Charlie's showing you here in these beautiful videos is what we've had to do to actually bypass this mechanism where we cannot, in the equine traditionally, we haven't been able to get this fertilization to occur. So we're actually selecting the sperm and inducing fertilization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after we collect the eggs, then um, we actually don't fertilize them right away. Uh, studies have shown that uh, actually holding them for a, a bit of a period of time uh, before you mature them uh, is, is actually better. It'll improve your developmental rates. So like I said, once we collect them, we'll, we'll hold them overnight in a traditional embryo holding uh, solution uh, at room temperature. In the past, what we'd have to do is we'd um, have to ship them in a special container uh, to maintain that particular temperature to an outside IVF lab. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of having our own IVF lab, but the one thing is, is we're, we're no longer going to be subject to the, the cruel uncertainties of UPS and, and FedEx. Um, it's amazing how many shipments uh, you'll get lost. And we actually this year stopped doing any type of um, collection that would require uh, shipment on a, on a, from a Friday to a Saturday, just because the propensity to get those shipments lost. And was significant and for an owner to to pay for a, an oocyte aspiration they're looking at well over a thousand dollars and that's just a wasted investment on their part when angus get lost so um, now that we have our own lab uh, we don't have to worry mm. about that um uh, but, but getting back to the original topic uh, we'll then hold them overnight uh, then these eggs will need to be matured for about 30 hours. So it takes a while, uh, the, the, the entire process does. And after that time period, uh, we'll then assess each single one uh, for maturity. And this, this video here uh, gives a good example of what a mature uh, equine oocyte or egg looks like. Uh, one of the, the, the biggest hallmark is the presence of the, the polar body shown here right at, at 12 o'clock. Uh, that's, that's a sign that it's entered the second phase of meiosis or M2, um, and it is ready for fertilization. A couple interesting things about uh, equine oocytes is, is, um, is that they have a couple of distinguishing features relative to other species. Number one, uh, this outer coating called the zona pellucida or ZP um, is, is very thick um, relative to other species like, like mice and humans and cattle. Um, and then uh, inside uh, the, the oplasm where, where the genetic material is contained and, and also where we deposit the sperm for fertilization contains a lot of fat or lipid, uh, which I find a little bit interesting because I don't typically think of horses as, as fatty type creatures. I think of them as, as more lean. Um, but it's for these, at least these two reasons, probably more uh, why um, freezing eggs is is very difficult uh, to do in, in horses currently. Um, so like I said, once we found an oocyte that's mature, uh, we will then uh, capture a sperm. Uh, and the sperm, uh, we, we do go or base that on uh, visual assessment. We try to select a sperm that is moving in a straight line and, and appears normal, uh, has no abnormalities to it. Uh, we'll then capture it, put it in the tip of our um, pipettes and as shown here uh, we'll then breach the zone of pellucida using that sharp tip um, and uh, what we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to aspirate some of the 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 oplasm back uh, because that'll break break the the membrane and here's an example of uh, the oplasm oops that was a example of a sperm being caught pardon uh here so once the oocytes penetrated, we then suck back oplasm and then deposit that oplasm along with the sperm back into the egg. So um, that's an example of what we call conventional ICSI. Gotcha. Okay. So what's the step after that? You've put them together, you know, like the oocyte's been harvested, it's been cultured, you put the sperm inside um there and the magic happens <laughs> it's a black box <laughs> it's a black box but um talk about the changes that you're looking for to sort of say this has been successful fertilization has occurred and how do you handle that in that critical period initially to make sure that you've got the best chance for success later on 
Sure. So um, as soon as the injections are, are performed, uh, they're then placed in a, in a culture medium um, and then housed in uh, an incubator. And we house them under special conditions, um, relatively high um, carbon dioxide concentrations, usually around six, six percent or so, um, but relatively also low oxygen tensions, also around six percent. Uh, we call it a, a trigas incubator. Um, and um, we, we have some really cool, cool incubators. Um, they're called what we call benchtop incubators, and they're basically like um, six incubators in in one um, which allows us to to culture multiple plates um, in, in in those incubators uh, so then they'll stay in there for about five days after they're injected so basically we're it's a it's a waiting game um, up until then uh, and then what we do is we will uh, then pull them um, out and I'm looking here for uh, and we show we're looking then for what we call cleavage and that's just is a, a sign of um, um, uh, early embryonic development and let's see if I can and basically the one cell is becoming two so mm -hmm. what you're seeing is now that cell is able to divide and it will continue to divide indefinitely until it becomes something something exciting <laughs> <laughs> yes um and at, Cleavage is, you know, it's, 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 um, I'm not exactly sure where that term comes from. Um, but this is an example of, of cleaved embryos, um, five days after, um, they've been inject injected. And these are all at various different states of cleavage. Um, we have, uh, one, two, and two here kind of on the outer edges, um, that are fairly advanced. Um, they've, they form morulas where the, the blastomeres are starting to, to really clump up and form like a cluster of grapes inside. And then you can see we have a couple others that have maybe formed only four to six cells, um, such as this one shown here. Um, develop, embryonic development um, does isn't um, uh, uh, this the same for every single oocyte that we inject. Um, there, there are likely some other factors intrinsic to both the, the oocyte and the sperm, as well as the oocyte sperm interaction uh, that, that may um, lead to delays in development or what have you. Um, and interestingly enough, this is kind of putting the cart a little bit before the horse, but I think some recent studies uh, out of Utrecht has shown that when embryos develop a little bit later, they're more likely to form females or fillies. Uh, when they form a little bit earlier, they're more likely to form colts. Um, so uh, to put that in a little bit more specific terms, uh, we consider day zero to be the day of injections, or like when we breed mares, the day of ovulation would be day zero. Um, so this would be day five. Um, but then let's say, uh, then after we'll move them to a new culture uh, media, and then this is what we hope that they look like uh, two days later. This is an example of a, of a nice um, equine blastocyst. A um, couple hallmarks demonstrating uh, that it is a blastocyst is a thinned out zona, uh, as well as presumptive trophectoderm um, lining the outer, outer rim of the, of the inner zona there too. So uh, this was a day seven embryo. Uh, and so as a result, it has a higher likelihood of form you know, cult uh, as opposed to, to a filly. Okay. So what happens next? You have what you look like is um, a transferable or a freezable product. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? Well, it depends. Um, so during the, the breeding season, um, you know, we'll, uh, if we, if a recipient is available, uh, we will we'll go ahead and, and, and transfer that. Um, if one is not, then we can go ahead and, and vitrify it. Um, and, uh, then the third or the third thing we could do, which is what we're, we're currently, um, developing is, um, biopsy it before we either transfer it or freeze it. And let me show you an example of the, of, of the biopsy method here um, because I think it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting and I really think this is probably um, we're going to be doing more and more of this over time because I mean you can use it to, to sex the embryo mm -hmm. um, in quarter horses you can use it to run the five panel disease um, test that, that evaluates for all the different muscle and skin diseases right um so uh it's and then pretty soon here i'm sure we can start uh using it for other particular monogenetic diseases as well very commonly used now um in in, in humans as well so which helps uh, you pick the best embryo ideally so you could potentially 
screen it, make sure that it's free or the most desirable of the ones you've frozen, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and so you could basically put this embryo after you've taken this biopsy sample, put it on ice, wait for the results to come back. And let's say you have a polo client and it comes back, it's a filly. They'll say, okay, go ahead and, and transfer it. Um, or if it's a colt, they might say, no, we, we, we don't, we don't want it because our polo clients by and large prefer fillies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and you're not having foals born like without ears after you biopsy them or anything. Like <laughs> no, fortunately, people very uh, a lot smarter than me, like like Catherine Hendricks. She's done a lot of those those studies looking at the quote normalcy of foals that have been born um, following um, ICSI, following biopsies of in vitro produced embryos, and now following true in vitro produced um, foals. So, um, no safety studies are I mean have been there. These foals are are, are normal. Um, and, um, for some people, um, they, they, they might perform better too, um, because they've done this pre-implantation genetic testing to kind of hedge their bets even more that they're going to get the horse that they want mm -hmm. instead of waiting just 340 days. Well, and so once you have that, basically you're probably transferring like you would just do a normal embryo into the recipient. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned a word before, I'd like you to span on vitrification. So oh, yeah. talk to us about vitrification to preserve these embryos. Oh, it's, it's a fancy term for freezing. Uh, but it also is a specific term. Um, I think vitrification is is, is basically um, f a, a means to form a, a, a glass-like um, solid state um, at, at very, very low temperatures. Um, and so basically these um, what vitrification entails um, is freezing in a very, very rapid process. So we expose them to relatively high concentrations of cryoprotectants um, for so just about five minutes or so, uh, and then plunge them into liquid nitrogen. So how that differs from, say, the traditional slow cooling method or when we freeze semen is that when we do a frozen semen or slow cooling, we gradually take the temperature down and we're gradually exposing it to different concentrations of cryoprotectants. But with this method, it's kind of a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, we're frozen. Um, but uh, fortunately, um, studies have shown that the vitrification or in vitro produced embryos um, tolerate uh, the vitrification method a lot better than slow freezing. And a, just a recent paper came out from Utrecht showing that um, in vivo or embryos we flush out of mares also respond better to vitrification. There's less intercellular damage mm -hmm. um, with vitrification because you don't give that chance for ice crystals to form. Okay. So, so oocytes don't freeze so well, embryos just fine. Yeah. And it allows you to then have or bank frozen embryos that you can use years, mm -hmm. you know, they're, you can store them indefinitely. So that's, that's one nice thing. And then mm -hmm. the other thing is that with the in vitro produced embryos or embryos that Charlie and Etta and Peter are producing in the lab, those, they can control the size at which they freeze them and they do better than sometimes when we do an embryo flush. So someone comes to us and says, I want to flush an embryo and freeze it. One of the issues is we don't know how big that embryo is when we flush it out and we may not, it may be too large. And mm -hmm. if the embryo is too large, it does not tolerate the freezing or vitrification process as well. So one of the advantages of having an ICSI lab is that if you do get out of the season when you'd want to be transferred into the recipient, you know, you could do oocyte harvesting and freeze those embryos and use them for next year, which is a little different than doing embryo flushing because it requires that the mare is still cycling and all these other factors, which when you get into fall may not be happening. So that's another advantage. Well, that's a great walk through the science, Charlie. So Mariah, where do you see this going, right? I mean, you have this lab, which, you know, Charlie said it's commercial, so where do we see it um, starting and where do we see it getting to? You mentioned there may be some different things that can be done with this. Yeah, so I'll be honest, when we first, when our group, Charlie and um, Dr. Scoggin and Dr. Brady Camp wanted to start this lab, I was thinking of it as something that I didn't know what the role of it was going to be. And, and honestly, was a little pessimistic about how this was going to be utilized. Was there really going to be a need for it? And when we first started talking about it, Oocyte aspiration in ICSI was really used for problem mares or mares that you could not recover an embryo for, from or you had very limited semen, whether the stallion had died or you just had a small amount of semen left. 
it has now over the last five years turned into something that has been used more for convenience. Um, so maybe you have a time limit on how long you can work with your mayor, particularly if she's in a performance setting. Um, it has also been used financially if it's a problem mayor or it may be more efficient and you may recover more embryos doing oocyte aspiration and ICSI compared to multiple embryo flushes where you're managing this mare very aggressively. So I believe that the industry where um, ICSI and embryo transfer is allowed, which is basically every breed other than the thoroughbred, I think people are starting to see a cost benefit of it. And I know people that used to do farms that used to do a lot of embryo flushes have just gone to bringing some of their top mares in for a few sessions and producing a bunch of embryos. Again, the results are variable for mare and stallion. So it's easy to say that each mare and stallion pairing that you want is different, but I do see a big increase in the demand. The efficiency of the procedure has gotten better and there's constantly new research that's improving the efficiency of it. So maybe Five years ago, three years ago, you'd get one embryo per two sessions. Now you expect to get about two embryos per session. So things are get you know, the science is improving. And in our lab, I really commend uh, Dr. Scoggin and Dr. Brady Camp and Dr. Sharon for the work that they've put in and holding things to a high standard to try to stay on top of how we can maximize the results. So this is a, an efficient procedure. When you come to us, you can expect a certain result and standard of care, which I think is so important when you're making these decisions. And if you've made the decision to go this route, you're trusting that this process has been validated. You mentioned, um, you know, like um, disease diagnosis. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, talk about that and talk about other things that you see this having an application besides generating little horses. Yeah, absolutely. So each year, more genetic tests or more markers for um for genetic causes of birth defects or issues in the horse become identified. And in the next 10 years, I mean, from where we were 10 years ago, there's many more screening applications for breeders, which is great because hopefully like with the impressive line or other, you know, mutations that we can screen for, it allows for smarter, more responsible breeding. So for people that are in that category of trying to produce an animal that's the best best example of the breed or that cross, as Charlie demonstrated with having, if you have several embryos and you can biopsy them, you have the option to pick, which is something that they've done in human IVF. And I only see that getting more. I mean, when you talk to researchers and bioinformatics and genetics, we're looking even at thoroughbreds. Um, so thoroughbreds, warm bloods, Arabians, saddlebreds, all of these horses have diseases that and they're not all commercially available, but I do see that coming in the next five to 10 years. And so that will be something when you're trying to breed that you can get those tests done. So being able to offer that even as the science evolves at Root and Riddle is an exciting thing to be able to do. So, so there's a couple of, uh, you know, you talked about females or, you know, fillies or mares that are performing that you might be able to use this on. Are there age limitations or do they just have to be cycling? Because we've all tried to breed the mare later in her career after she's done when that's just, that's not going to work out. Is IVF a, 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 an option for those mares? You want to feel that one, Charlie? Well, actually, before we go there, I want to um, touch on something Mariah um, said earlier, and that was um, the development of the lab and um, her pessimism actually was, was useful because it, it, it held us up to a standard. <laughs> Um, he wants that, to kill me, but it was <laughs> we did, right? And I think some people would be shocked to see the fact that we're sitting here together laughing. Um, but but no, the but it, it it was the it was the her standards as well as the standards of everybody else. I'm a pain in the butt. <laughs> that 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 made us, um, I don't want to say forced us, but um pretty close to take our time to make sure we did it right. Um like I said earlier, this was not a cookbook. There was no cookbook available. We knew that it was going to take three to five years, but we, we didn't know all the roadblocks and obstacles. We didn't know COVID-19 was going to hit as soon as we started our lab, that, mm -hmm. those types of things. 
Um, so, but, but that type of thing, having these standards and that's why it's take, it's, it's taken a while, but now that we've reached those milestones and those standards, um, it, it's, it's quite, it's quite rewarding. Um, so, but it doesn't mean we're going to rest on our laurels, um, by any means. And, um, you know, back to your question about age, that's another great thing about this is that, um, you can apply it in almost any aged horse. Um, and so, yes, for your, your older mares, say you, she's having trouble cycling or her, she, she has such a dirty uterus that no matter how many medications or series of acupuncture or hyperbaric therapy you've run her through, you can't get it cleaned up. Um, this is good indication for, for, for that. Um, so, um, and then, you know, just so we can toot our own horn just a little bit more, uh, two weeks ago, we had a mare that had to be euthanized on, on the table, a saddlebred mare. And, um, they said, well, can you collect her, harvest her ovaries? And, um, so we, we did that. We got some oocytes and, um, got an embryo here and then transferred it last week and got a pregnant recipient. So being able to, to offer that, especially in the, in the middle of the night, not mm -hmm. having to make all these arrangements about who's going to come in and scrape the ovaries or, or arrange flights, you know, this and that, the fact that we can take care of our clients with almost minimal hassle. Um, I think they they'll see benefits in that in the future. Yeah, it does actually. Hit. There's less moving parts, right? Because you're yeah. right. I mean, we've all been disappointed, unfortunately, with you know things going missing uh, with logistics, with transport. I mean, it just happens. Planes get cancelled. Things get left on the runway in Memphis. <laughs> I mean, it's happened to us all, <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it's not not good. So, um, fascinating talk. Um, any summary comments? I, I would just say I'm really proud of how these guys have worked and the standard that they've worked to to make it possible. It takes a lot of work and faith to do this and try to provide that. So yeah. I'll give a shout out to the whole group for what they've done. Yeah, no, I'll second that. It's, yeah. I, I, I've seen the lights on, you know, I, I, a lot of times you feel like you're the last person here and, and, and as I'm leaving the lights in that lab are still on. And so yep. I, I know a lot of hard dedication went into that and it was uh, self-motivated. Yep. And very yeah. much appreciate it. I mean, yeah, we're all impressed. You've sort of taken it from nothing to something. And even Dr. Skepticism <laughs> over here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kept you on the straight and narrow. And I mean, yeah. look what we've got. So we're all, we're all very impressed. And, you know, it's just great to be able to offer that service, right? And people sort of say, what can I do? I say, walk on down the hill and, you know, we can get you taken care of. Yeah. So uh, that was still so for this week. We've been with Dr. Charlie Scoggin and Dr. Mariah Schnobrick talking about the IVF and Ixley Lab here at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital. See you next time.